Tell me a story. When we hear those simple words, it invites us into a relationship. Tell me a story. That's in part why we've been uh, going through this worship series, Tell Me a Story, because those stories of Jesus have such impact on our hearts and on our lives and the ways in which we try to better understand how we're supposed to live, right? Tell me a story. So I have a story I want to share with you today. It has nothing to do with the Bible, but I hope eventually it will get us there, right? So back in the 1980s, the early 1980s, way before there were standardized tests in the Texas school systems, at least they may have been elsewhere, but not in Texas, there was a high school principal. And the high school principal wanted to sort of uh, upgrade the kids' learning experience and work with the teachers to make that experience better. And so the principal called in three of his teachers. He said to them, you're some of our best and brightest, and I want to offer you an opportunity. And so he said to them, I want you to get creative. I want for you to get innovative. I want for you to get clever in the way in which you teach. And I'm going to assign to you 90 of the highest IQ'd students we've got in the sophomore class, and I want you to do everything you can to help grow them and train them and educate them and help make them better students. And so they were game, these teachers, and uh, they wanted to make it happen, so they did. So as they went through the semester and the rest of the calendar uh, school year, they taught them well and these kids learned so much and, and they grew so much. And at the end of the school year, they learned what they had assumed would take place. These 90 students had clearly learned about 25% more material than any of the other kids in that grade level. When they tested, they tested much higher at all of the skill sets and and in all of the classes. They tested much better in every class, English and lit and, and math and science and history. They did really, really well. So at the end of the year, uh, the principal called them in and thanked those teachers and celebrated with those teachers and they thanked those kids and they celebrated with those kids and they had a great time to uh, give thanks for all that they'd done and how much they'd learned and how it had worked just as they'd planned. Well, the next day came, and the principal called the three teachers who he had uh, given a claim to and certainly given the opportunity to, and he called them in and said, hey, I just wanted you to know something. Um, those 90 students that you had, they really weren't high IQ. They really weren't anything special. They were actually really just the normal everyday kids in the sophomore class. You took normal kids with no special abilities, no special gifts, no special talents, no special intelligence, and you helped teach them well. And they literally raised the grade farther than we could ever imagine. And then he said, and I just want to share one other thing, um, and I'm really uh, sad to share this, but it's the truth. Um, You guys weren't special either, the three of you. by the way, you were really just uh, average teachers, and I just wanted you to know that. And, and, and you could feel the steam coming out of their head, right? Because, man, they thought they were special, and they thought these kids that they'd had were special. And, and they kind of steamed about it for a while, and then he, he just kind of let it all sink in, the principal did. And then they began to turn from anger uh, to a little bit of excitement and a little bit of understanding, because what they realized was, even though they may not have been special, and even though those kids might not have been special, they did something special, right? They took ordinary average kids, nothing special about them, ordinary average uh, teachers, and nothing special about them. And they raised the level of education, and they raised the capacity of those students, and they allowed them to do something that they would not have otherwise done, simply and solely because that principle was clever enough and creative enough to make them believe that they were better than they were. And then they got it. And they recognized that there was something really special about that. He was clever, that principal. He was creative, I think. Um, Some would even say he was shrewd, right? Now, most of us, when we hear the word shrewd, we have sort of this negative connotation. Maybe it's something sort of under the radar and uh, maybe something slightly unethical. But in this case, uh, and in most cases, really, shrewd is really quite clever and creative. Because while those teachers were initially upset and didn't fully get it, they ultimately recognized that he had done something about who they were and made them into something that they were not. And likewise, the students as well. Shrewdness is a fascinating concept. I want us to listen or or look just for a minute about a definition of shrewdness because it's going to help hinge for us uh, the story that we hear this morning. So if that principle was clever... If he was creative, he was also shrewd, because when you look up the word shrewd, and you might want to jot this down in your sermon notes there, when you look up the word shrewd, it has a very positive connotation to it. It means astute or sharp in practical matters, astute or sharp 
in practical matters. He took the very practical matter of education, and in an astute and sharp manner, he helped raise both the teacher's capacity and the student's capacity. So another way to look at it is uh, to be uh, shrewd is also maybe to be either smart or clever in a practical way. And wouldn't you say that's what he did? He took the very practical concept and he very cleverly and smartly made it all better, shrewd. And a part of our task today is to better understand the biblical nature of shrewdness and what it means to be clever and sharp, astute and smart for the kingdom's sake. So hopefully by the time we're done this morning, we will have a better comprehension of the most difficult parable in all of the Scriptures. It's a parable that most of us stay away from, but we want to deliberately to put it in our series because it is a story of faith, and it's really quite a provocative story of faith that tells us how to be shrewd for the kingdom of God. So turn with me, if you will, to Luke's gospel in the 16th chapter, the first nine verses. It's not only the most difficult parable, but it's the least studied of all the parables because of the first reason. Here's the way it goes. Jesus told this story to His disciples. There was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. One day, a report came that the manager was wasting his employer's money. So the employer called him in and said, what is this I hear about you? Get your report in order because you are going to be fired. The manager thought to himself, now what? My boss has fired me. I don't have the strength to dig ditches, and I'm too proud to beg. Ah, I know how to ensure that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I'm fired. So he invited each person who owed money to his employer to come and discuss the situation. He asked the first one, how much do you owe him? The man replied, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. So the manager said to him, take the bill and quickly change it to 400 gallons. And how much do you owe my employer? He asked the next man. I owe him 1,000 bushels of wheat, was his reply. Here, the manager said, take the bill and change it to 800 bushels. You can well imagine they're all pretty happy about this, right? The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. And it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of light. Here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. Friends, this is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So a parable, a different kind of parable, right? Um, Many of us in this room probably have either never heard that parable or the first time we heard it, we thought, man, that makes absolutely no sense at all, so I'm not going to spend any time at all on that one, right? Because it's strange. I mean, there's, there's absolutely no question that this is a strange parable. And here's what I want us to know about parables, just a couple of things first of all. One is, uh, no matter what the parable, uh, no matter who the characters are, no matter what the analogy is or the metaphor used in the parable, every parable that Jesus teaches has one purpose and one purpose only. And that is, how do we live the kingdom of God? How does this help amplify or magnify or help us to better understand how I'm supposed to live the kingdom of God? That's what those stories were all about. The mustard seed, the lost son, the lost coin, uh, the workers in the vineyard, all of the parables are all about what does this say about how we live the kingdom of God, right? Uh, So that's first off. Second off, this parable is really kind of hard because in most of the parables, not all, but in most of the parables, there is a pretty clear analogy to the players on the field, right? Uh, You know, in the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son from which we uh, spoke a few weeks ago, you know, the dad is pretty much God, right? And we need to be as gracious as the father and the prodigal is this younger punk kid who runs off and does stupid and wasteful things and the older brother is the judgmental. And it's easy to put us in the place, right, in many of the parables. But in this parable, not so much, right? I mean, it's just kind of weird because the manager who has uh, lots of money uh, to which uh, many people owe lots of money, uh, he has this employer that has not been doing well, and when he goes and writes off some of the stuff, the, the, the owner lifts him up and says, what a great guy he is. And, and you're kind of going, wait a minute, he's dishonest, he's cutting you some, he's, he's going to... Uh, 
make sure you don't get your money and it's not working out for you and yet you lift him up. So a part of what we need to know is that it's not that straightforward. It's why it's hard, okay? The second thing I want to say about this particular parable is it's in chapter 16 and it's a portion of the entire chapter and the whole chapter speaks volumes about the one concept that this one speaks about. Much like over the last few weeks when we've covered Luke chapter 15, the lost coin, the, the lost pearl, uh, and the, I'm sorry, the lost sheep and the uh, lost son, all three of those stories have one thing in common, right? Lostness. How can someone be found and that God relentlessly pursues us, right? So all three of those stories tell the same thing. The same is true in Luke chapter 16 here from which we've read today. There are two parables, one from which we read, and then there's another one about um, Lazarus and a rich guy who both die. They both find themselves in the place of the dead, and one of them is doing all right, Lazarus, and the rich guy's not so much in the, in, uh, after death. And so they both tell the story of what it would have been like had we done what was right when we lived? Had we done what was right building the kingdom of God when we lived? Because ultimately, remember, every parable, no matter what the parable's analogy or players or anything, is all about the kingdom. But that in turn is also what makes this an awkward parable. Because you heard at the end, not only is this dishonest guy lifted up, but it talks about how he's going to get a place for an eternal home as well. And we automatically start thinking, well, eternal home, heaven, you know, where I go after I die, because that's the way we normally describe eternal home. But a parable is not talking about heaven. A parable is talking about the kingdom of God. A parable is helping us to better understand how we live God's way now. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? That's what we just prayed. And so a part of our goal as a follower of Jesus is that we are to help build God's kingdom on earth, that we are to do God's will and live God's way now, that we are to be about mercy and grace and justice and love, all of the things that make up God's ways, we're to do that now. And so Jesus tells this parable, and we've got to try to figure out what does it mean? Well, it hinges on that word shrewd. It hinges on the way that man is lifted up for his shrewd behavior as it relates to the kingdom of God, as it helps us better understand what we are supposed to do as followers of Jesus. Now, um, it seems weird, I know, so let's, let's see if there's some other language in the Gospels that might help us a little bit. So, Jesus, when He sent the 12 and certainly when He sent the 70, gave them some basic instruction. Matthew's gospel tells us in Matthew chapter 10 that Jesus said to them as He was sending them out, now look, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. You need to be as shrewd as a snake and as harmless as a dove. Well, in other translations, that word shrewd right there in the New Living is actually translated, and you may have memorized it this way, as wise as a serpent, right? Or as clever as a snake. Well, there's a reason those other words are used, because shrewd means clever, right? It means astute or sharp in practical matters. It means smart or clever in practical ways. And so we are to be practical and clever in the ways in which we go out into the world but in a specific way and for a specific purpose. And Jesus did this, right? I mean, Jesus was shrewd. Uh, think about it. So when, when people would ask Jesus a question, well, what does this mean, Jesus? Or what do you mean by that? Or how could you say this? Jesus would often respond how? With another question, right? He would rarely sort of say, well, here's the answer. You know, that's what it says, right? He would often say, well, what do you say? Or what does it say? Or how does it read, right? So there's always another question. That's shrewd. It's clever. It's creative. It's likewise the whole reason Jesus told parables, right? They were in response to people's thoughts or queries about what does this all mean? How am I supposed to live out faith? Uh, what am I supposed to do? And he would tell the story. Well, there was a man who fell among robbers and, you know, he'd tell a story. It's a parable. That's clever. It's creative. It's a way to help pull someone in to the life story of faith. It would drive the Pharisees crazy, wouldn't it? 
because they wanted the answer. They wanted the simple solution. They wanted everything to work the way they had anticipated. So why don't you just give me the answer? Because <laughs> Jesus was shrewd. And I'm pretty convinced he was shrewd because as a good Hebrew, he knew the Hebrew Scriptures, right? And in part, those Hebrew Scriptures would describe for him what this clever and creative way was all about. So there's a, a, a genre of writing in the Hebrew Scriptures known as the wisdom literature, Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. And one of those uh, books, the book of Proverbs, literally is a book of wisdom. And at the very beginning in chapter 1, it describes why these Proverbs are important. Verse 1, 2, 3, and then in verse 4 it says, it's important to teach shrewdness to the simple and knowledge and prudence uh, to the young. Well, that word shrewdness, likewise in other translations, is to teach wisdom to the unwise, to teach creatively to those who don't yet know what it means, the young, right? And, and so shrewdness is a way of being, and it's not to be an unethical jerk, <laughs> it's to be creative and astute and clever, in this case, for the kingdom of God, to do God's work, to be God's people, to build God's kingdom. And I love the way Eugene Peterson renders it in the message because he really helps to bring it forth in the most vivid light as it relates to the kingdom rather than some place to which we go after we die. Not that that's non-existent, but that our purpose as living save, uh, people of Jesus are to build the kingdom now. Here's what Peterson says in at Luke 16, verse 9. I want you to be smart in the same way, referencing the way um, the guy took advantage of the people. I want you to be smart in the same way, but for what is right, using every adversity to stimulate you to creative survival, to concentrate your attention on the bare essentials so that you'll live, really live and not complacently just get by on good behavior. You see, Peterson knows and recognizes that this is a life thing, that this is a living thing, that this is a kingdom-building thing, this story about how to be shrewd for the kingdom. Because here's the, here's the horrible reality about us. We're pretty shrewd about a lot of stuff in the world, right? I mean, in our, in our workaday world, we can be shrewd about all kinds of stuff. I can be clever and creative about how I'm going to get that promotion in my job. I can put a lot of energy and effort into that. I can be shrewd about new sales techniques and trying to figure out how to push my wares and hawk my stuff and make sure others are getting… I can get awfully creative and astute about reaching the goals that my supervisor sets for me, right? That's just the truth. Students. We can get creative about the ways we try to avoid homework. Right? Oh, I'm not supposed to say that, aren't I? But we can, right? We can make up all kinds of creative, clever things about what happened to my homework or where it went, right? Or maybe we could put a lot of creative energy and attention into getting better grades too, right? Moms and dads, when we have little ones, don't we often get clever and creative and Trying to get them to go to sleep when they won't go to sleep. Trying to get them to eat that nasty green stuff that we don't even like to eat, but we know they're supposed to be eating. Yeah? Or the way in which we discipline them as we recognize we need to get more and more creative as they learn our ways more and more as they get older. We can get awfully shrewd. And innately, there's nothing wrong with that. But the analogy in the parable is about taking that shrewdness, that creativity, that astuteness, that cleverness, and redirecting its energy onto the kingdom, onto living God's ways, into being more just, into being more loving, into being more grace-filled, into being more merciful and compassionate. Take that creativity that's going into my job or into my schooling or into any other situation and turn it toward God. Turn it toward building God's kingdom. And guess what? Jesus would also say, seek first the kingdom and its righteousness and what? All these other things will come to, right? Some of you may know the guy. He's kind of old, but his name's John Wesley. You ever heard of him, John Wesley? You know, he's the one who in the 18th century began what we now call the Methodist movement, right? 
and all of the off branches, the Church of the Nazarene and the Wesleyan Church and the Holiness Church, all stem from John Wesley. And a part of that great recognition is John Wesley was a prim and proper Anglican priest, well-trained at Oxford University, preaching in all the high steeple churches and doing all the right things until he began to discover that there were folks among him that could not, would not, couldn't come into the church, either because of their own created barriers, they felt unworthy, or they felt as though uh, no one would receive them because they were uneducated, they were poor, uh, they didn't know how to do the right things, they didn't know the rubrics for worship. He began to recognize that there were thousands upon thousands of people who were missing out on the good news of Christ. And yet he was, after all, a prim and proper priest, preaching from the pulpit week in and week out. But then he discovered that there was a more clever way to do that, that there was a more creative way to reach the masses, that there was a shrewd way to build God's kingdom. And so he left the church. He left the pulpit, and he went out to the foundries where they were creating iron. He went out to the coal mines where they were digging deep ditches and their faces were charcoal black and they were stinky and smelly and they were uneducated and they didn't have anything to do with the church because the church would have nothing to do with them. But because he was creative and clever and shrewd, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people came to faith in Jesus because he took the word to them Rather than waited for them to come, he was shrewd like that manager. Many of us have these smartphones, right? I love my smartphone, and yet the chain that it attaches me to is a bit cumbersome. Some of you know there's many apps, hundreds if not thousands of apps, and one of those apps is called UVerse. How many of us have heard of UVerse? How many of us use it? It's a powerful tool developed by a church just up the road in Edmond, Oklahoma. They decided that they wanted to engage people in Scripture, and so the church developed this soft, this app so that people could access from any place, anytime, anywhere, from any phone or computer for that matter, God's Word, so that it didn't matter where you were, what trip you were on, you could have access to the Bible in English or in Spanish or in any other language. You've got access, and it's free, and it costs nothing because they knew that engagement in Scripture is the number one catalyst to growing faith. So they got creative, clever, some would say shrewd, to build God's kingdom utilizing every resource possible, Luke chapter 16 says, what time, what talent, what treasure, what skill, what ability, what gift, what means can any of us use to build God's kingdom? Let's take the energy and the resources that we keep plowing into bettering ourselves, to making sure we've got our place secure, to making sure that everything is going just our way, to turning it towards the kingdom of God and making the kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. I wonder what it would be like if we could use the everyday tangible things of life, our homes, our cars, our skill set, our education, our dollars, our time, our talents, and use them for the bettering of the kingdom rather than the bettering of self. That's what the business owner was praising, shrewdness for the kingdom, securing a better life for everybody, not just for me, helping God's way become the way, the truth, the life, so that all not just me, not just us, all could live, could really live. What would that be like? I wonder. I wonder if we could get creative and clever, maybe even shrewd for the kingdom of God. Let's, let's try. Let's see what it's like. Maybe so. This day and the next.
Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, thank you. Thank you that you were creative enough in the very beginning to make us in your image. Thank you, God, that you were astute enough to know that we needed relationship with you and your son Jesus, and so you made it possible. Thank you, God, that you were clever enough to help us each and every day to try desperately to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and our neighbor as ourselves. Thank you, God, that you were shrewd enough to know that through it all, we would need you and we would need your love so that we could love others to build your kingdom, to make it so here and now for your kingdom's sake. God, give us courage, give us strength, And help us to be clever and astute for those practical matters that build your kingdom. In the name of Jesus Christ, we now pray. Amen. Friends, as we come now to the offering, to the giving of our gift.